Take a deep breath. Relax. Inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Sit back and close your eyes. Gradually release the tension, starting from your toes, working up your legs to your pelvis, and from your fingertips, slowly up your arms to your shoulders. The Stacking Benjamins Show, no matter how bad it gets, is your favorite podcast. I will count backwards from three, and when I snap my fingers, you'll be overcome with delight at hearing the start of this episode. Three, two, one. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and this is The Stacking Benjamin Show. Hey, money fans, hungry? We're throwing a huge party down here in the basement. I'm talking mom's made us a feast. You got your nachos, you got your pizza, you got your cake, and even those fantastic mini weenies and the ketchup sauce. Hashtag yum. Why the celebration? Well, today's the 225th birthday of the New York Stock Exchange, and you're going to help us give a warm welcome to best-selling author Emily Guy Birkin. Also, more headlines about Johnny Depp's money issues and learning about money as you age. We'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Jordan, who has a tax question, and answer a letter from Taylor, who wants to know about whether to invest or pay down debt. And we can't forget, like the candle on this chocolate pie over here, I'll even throw in a slice of my trivia. Now, here come two guys who aren't afraid to talk into the mic with a mouthful of mini weenies, Joe and O-J-J-J-G. Hey, you found us. Welcome to Wednesday. I am Joe Saul. See, hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across this little card table from me, it is the man himself. Oh, man, we're glad he's back. The other guy, or as we call him here, OG. At least it's not the rickety card table anymore. It's just an old card table. We propped it up with those napkins. Like when you're at the restaurant and the table you're seated at kind of rocks back and forth, so you just stuff a napkin underneath the And you know what's funny? Is, well, you know what's funny? Is people think we're joking. I know. <laughs> people totally think we're joking. Hey, you know, when people know we're not joking, OG is when we send them to stackybenjamins.com forward slash SoFi, because when you head to SoFi, you know what you find? You find that those student loan interest rates you have are absolutely garbage and you can do much better. SoFi is the leader in marketplace lending. OG, you're a marketplace lender, aren't you? Don't you stand in your front yard and just uh, deal out loans and stuff? I'm more of a marketplace borrower. Okay. Gotcha. On the street. <laughs> I more stand at the side of the corner with like a jar. Will podcast for food? Yes. Right. Uh, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash SOFI. And guess what? For your student loans, for the personal loans, and for mortgages, you go there. Uh, our friend Dan Macklin says it takes less than just a couple minutes. Less than just a couple minutes? I don't think he said that. But he did say it was very quick. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash SOFI. And the place that calls... SoFi number one, wherever you look on their site, Magnify Money. If you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money, you know, here's what's funny about Magnify Money, OG, is that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not hilarious. Oh, not ha-ha funny. In fact, it's funny, my, uh, <laughs> bro- funny? <laughs> <laughs> my brother-in-law, whenever you say, you know what's funny? He always says mimes. And he's like, yeah, not really. They're not funny. Like every single time. And it's annoying. And then I realize how many times I say, you know what's funny? When it really isn't funny, but it actually isn't funny. I'm being very serious when I say that. Have, have you been to a comparison site that's better laid out than Magnify Money? Like that whole fine print rating. Nothing drives me crazier than fine print. Like if I've got to wade through a bunch of crap and I find out that your offer isn't really what it should have been, or even if I'm scrolling, right? And there's page after page after page, like how comfortable am I dealing with you when I've got but 25 yeah, pages? The that- reality is, is that you don't read that anyway, right? right? So you're looking at Magnify Money going, thankfully, I don't have to read this one because they this one's this one's clear and concise. Like when, you're, when your iPod refreshes, and Apple says, here's some new terms. And you go, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah I realize. <laughs> Agree and okay. Right. I realize you probably own everything that I own, 
right? Yeah, yeah, We're going right. to take your kids. I'm giving your up, uh, giving up all rights to everything in perpetuity. <laughs> I understand. Magnify Money shows you the fine print rating. They also show you the rating for the interest rate that you're going to pay, whether it's going to be a high interest rate, if it's savings or a low interest rate, if it's consolidation, auto loans, credit cards, whatever the financial product is you're looking for, Magnify Money is the number one place to go. And the Magnify Money blog is an awesome place too. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. By the way, we're working on having them every Thursday now on our Facebook page. We sit down with some experts or you and I talk. We try to have some fun on Thursdays. And guess what? Thursday at noon next week, we're trying to get either Mandy Woodruff from Magnify Money or Nick Clements to talk uh, to talk credit cards and interest rates. So how about that? Well, we'll let you know more on that uh, in the next few days. But what we're going to let you know about now, we got a fantastic Emily Guy Birkin coming down to the basement again, OG. We love Emily. She's one of my favorite people to read on the internet. She has a new book, End Financial Stress Now. You never feel financial stress, do you? Never. Never. And you're not going to after that. We're going to talk opportunity cost. I realized, you know what? Instead of talking about everything that she talks about here, I, I love her chapter on opportunity cost. So I said, Emily, you just want to explain what this means to people. Because one of those terms that you and I know a lot about, but man, when you dig into opportunity cost and sunk cost, you know, I think those are a couple important things. So we're gonna- people deal with that with their stock trading all the time, right? right. <laughs> but I bought it at 10. It's at five. Yeah. It just is, right? <laughs> it's it's not, it's not where it was. It's where it's going. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter where it was. Uh, yeah. That's past. But first, it's a sunk cost. we got some phenomenal headlines. So let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. First headline today comes to us from the Wall Street Journal. This is written by Anna Marie Lasardi. How much financial knowledge do people acquire as they age? What do you think? Uh, nothing. Yeah, the rest of that headline, not much. <laughs> she says uh, people often... And it gets worse as they get older, actually. Well, yeah, listen to this. People often argue that financial knowledge can be acquired with experience, but if the evidence from a new survey index is any indication, that way of learning may, in fact, be very slow or not work well at all. The TIAA Institute-GFLEC Personal Finance Index, or PFIN Index for short, provides a snapshot of Americans' understanding of basic financial concepts, And the results don't look too promising. U.S. adults surveyed only answered about half of the questions in the index correctly. Just 16% demonstrated a relatively high level of personal finance understanding. They answered more than three quarters of the questions correctly. But what was most surprising... So 75% is a high understanding, a C average. (laughs) Is that what she just said? (laughs) No, I said 16% demonstrated a relatively high level of personal finance understanding. 16. Yeah, but then of that, oh, gotcha. They defined it as yes. three quarters of the questions correct. Yes, yeah. So sixteen percent of people got a C, and that's relatively high, which I, I guess, Einstein's uh, theory of relativity in well, effect. Most surprising to them is that Americans' knowledge of personal finance is low, even among people who have already made many important and fundamental financial decisions. This includes older Americans who own investment assets. She says, specifically by age 45, only 10% of respondents could answer more than three quarters of survey questions correctly. We're not learning. We're not learning. Is it because we don't give a crap? I think it's actually because of, you know, in human development, when you take a look at people's basic perceptions, this is, this is phenomenal. By the age of 12, people start to solidify their opinions about the world. And Mm -hmm. studies, previous studies have shown, and you've probably seen this, that if something disagrees with your already prearranged worldview, you don't disagree. You don't even hear it. So I've got a couple more years for the little OGs running around so I can just really drill into their skull the way the world really works. You got to make them as as creepy and weird as possible. And the clock is ticking if they're going to (laughs) keep up with the old man. (laughs) I, I kind of feel like I've grown over the last 30 years from 12 till present. I think the big learning here is that we have to stay open. You know, we, we shut ourselves down at a young age and we go, no, and, and we don't like being wrong, right? I mean, how many times have you tried to introduce a new concept to somebody in a meeting and they get all embarrassed and flustered because they don't know what you're talking about and they feel this shame? I remember yeah. all these meetings where people felt the shame. I'm like, there's no reason to feel shame. Nobody knows this stuff. Right. I had a, I had a conversation with a client one time where I found out that their advisor, air quotes, was... um for all intents and purposes, a criminal. 
and I was trying to figure out how to handle that because the first thing that I thought of was if someone brought that to my attention, that someone that I had trusted was not who I thought they would be, I would feel embarrassed about that. Like, how did I not see it? Right. How did I, how did I have my family uh, engaged with this, this, uh, this person? And then I remembered that there's all sorts of examples throughout time and history, both with money and other things where, you know, you just didn't see it. I'm watching the documentary uh, on CNBC right now of uh, Bernie Madoff. I mean, he had he had him conned for 25 years. And smart people, like he yeah, had some like, yeah, really these were, smart yeah, people. Yeah, they they were highlighting all these uh, circles that he ran in. You know, and he's got he's got funds of hedge funds that are feeding him money. And uh, and he, they, in the show, they were going through showing exactly how he just he just lied to him point blank. They're like, well, you've given us a ream of paper, so. We think you're pretty good. You must be up on the up and up because uh, you just gave me a binder full of stuff. And he just, you know, he's uh, talking in the background, kind of that third person view going, <laughs> I had him. I had him as soon as I told him there were no fees, you know, or whatever. So, yeah, I think we have to we have to do a better job, not just of learning from our mistakes, but of saying, you know, I don't know what I don't know. And it's funny because the smartest people that I worked with were the ones Usually, usually it seemed that were the they were the quickest to say, yeah, I don't know anything about that. Explain how that works, you know, and I think it's that openness that made them smarter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've talked about unique ability, a concept that I really try to try to work on in my life and my business. Right. You're really good at your thing and just be really good at that and and let other people help with the things that you're really that you're not really good at. Yeah, I think that's a big lesson for us all. Uh, discouraging, but doesn't have to be for you personally. Our second headline is a follow-up from Monday Story. Remember how on Monday, OG, we talked about Johnny Depp and the financial problems that Johnny Depp... Oh, Johnny. Yeah. Oh, oh. Having some, allegedly, having some, according to these articles, having some uh, money issues and in a lawsuit with his former managers. Uh, let's pivot on this story, though, to a story in Investment News. And this is Investment News is written for financial advisors. And it says how to handle your clients who share Johnny Depp's alleged compulsive buying habits. And I thought this was an interesting one-two punch. This is written by Liz Skinner. She says, financial advisors who've dealt with clients like Johnny Depp, an alleged compulsive spender with $2 million in monthly bills, have found methods of reforming their clients' errant shopping. Uh, it goes back into, if you want to listen to exactly what Johnny Depp's going through, go back and listen to Monday's episode. But uh, Tia Lee Director of Wealth Planning at Spectrum Management Group says, quote, excessive spending is the number one barrier to saving for retirement. She has a novel approach to helping clients after years of trying to get them to simply stay within a traditional budget had failed. She says with compulsive spenders, she has them budget their lives, not their money. So here's, here's what she did. I love this. She had a, a woman she worked with who was racking up $12,000 a month shopping for clothes and other things online. So she let... The woman, well, she, the woman could do whatever she wanted to, right? People, right. People yeah. do about, but they agreed that the woman would still shop online, but everything went into the cart, but she couldn't press go on the cart until Friday. So each week on Friday, she would decide which of those items actually got bought. So instead of buying immediately, compulsively, she had to wait till Friday. And initially, it went down, according to the story, the woman cut back by 5000 of the 12000 a month. So she cut from 12000 to 7000 a month shopping online. Still, what a savings. Well, yeah, huge savings. Still a champion. But, yeah. But, but, but isn't that... She's still winning the gold medal award on Amazon. Yeah, but, but, but it's funny. You set up these things, whether it's with help with a financial advisor yeah. or, or yourself, where you put this delayed gratification, this I just have to wait a couple of days before I make that move. What a powerful little tool that is. We've all have uh, little foibles in our lives. I, I used to uh, have a nicotine addiction for 17 years, right? Like that was just what I did. It was, I started in high school. And for me, I couldn't figure out a way to not do it, right? Like everything I did was tied to, was tied to, uh, to you know, you ate, you, you, you woke up from a nap. <laughs> you woke up from, you know, you got up in the morning, you were out with friends, all of that revolved around. And and so what I decided was 
I whittled it down to here's the one place where I buy it at, right? So where do I buy nicotine products at? For me, it was the gas station. So I'd put the gas pump in and I'd walk in and I'd come back out. My gas would be filled up. So my thing was, I said, I am never walking into another gas station for the next week. I'm just going to fill up at the pump. And that just eliminated it, right? And, and then the next week it was, well, this week I'm not going to walk into a gas station. And so I wasn't trying to say the whole, like, I'm never going to do this again because that's not realistic. Right. I'm just saying today I'm not going to do it. And uh, eight years removed, I still think about it. <laughs> I still find myself in a gas station going, huh, look at those pretty shiny things up there in the counter behind the, nah, not today, maybe tomorrow. Right. So it's a great idea to eliminate that, uh, eliminate one thing, just put a roadblock there. Right. Roadblocks don't click, are. Don't click till Friday. Yeah, we think about doing things faster. And I just got back from this technology conference, technology and credit union conference. We're going to do a show on that next Monday, by the way, going through some of the cool innovations we're seeing in technology. But that's about making it go faster and making financial decisions easier. Sometimes it's better if you make it slow down, right? If you, you know, this this strategy that that we talk about, about putting a little distance between you and your money. Like you, if you have problems with your debit card all the time, put your money in a savings account at a different bank across town that has no debit card access. Yeah. Get a roadblock. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got to drive across town to get that money, I'll tell you what's going to happen. If it's a real emergency, who cares? You're going to drive. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter. But if it's not an emergency, you find another way. Absolutely yeah. love that. I'll link yeah. to both of these in the show notes at stackybedjamins.com. But I think our two lessons here are number one, roadblocks, not necessarily a bad thing. And number two, financial knowledge. Maybe the majority of people aren't getting smarter, but if you keep an open mind and question everything and ask why and how does that work and maybe not, not as good as that as I should be, you can still continue to gain knowledge along the road. I feel like this is our BFF coming down to the basement. Emily Guy Birkin has written just about everywhere. She writes the Live Like a Mensch column for the Dollar Stretcher. She's a contributor to popular sites, Wise Bread, PT Money, Money Crashers, Yahoo Finance, and Business Insider. Uh, one of her last books, Choose Your Retirement, has the best header ever. Some guy named Joe Saul Cihai. On the top Never of the book. Him. Yeah, yeah, sketchy. It makes that book sketchy. Her new book, End Financial Stress. Now, we're not going to talk about all financial stress, but we are going to talk about what creates financial stress. And I think it's not understanding opportunity cost and overemphasizing what we call sunk cost. And here to help us with that is the one and only our good friend, Emily Guy Birkin, coming down to the basement. Guy Birkin, how have you been? Busy, but very good. I moved to Milwaukee this year. Well, that's busy, but you're moving. What do you do? Do you type as you move? Because you're cranking out books like nobody's business. <laughs> no, not quite. I actually took two months off for the move, but uh, then made up for it by writing my new book in about six weeks. <laughs> yeah. If it were a different podcast, I'd ask you about deadlines and about <laughs> staying up all night and, you know, 20,000 words a day, but it's not. But I do have a complaint. Okay. So I'm looking at the new, here, I'll show this to you across the card table. I'm looking at the new book and I'm looking at the top right there. And I don't understand. There's this blank space at the top. And let me show you, let me show you the choose your retirement book, which which is clearly my favorite. Look at, if you see that one, it has Mm -hmm. this awesome quote by me. What did you Mm -hmm. lose? Did you lose my number? Like, I feel like I've been used. Like you just, you know, you had me do the quote. And then you throw me away. (laughs) The way my mom always puts it is like, use me up like a Kleenex and just throw me away. (laughs) There it is. That's how I feel. How do you defend not putting me on another cover? Well, they they didn't ask me to get a quote. (laughs) These are decisions that are above my pay grade. I'm just the writer. You have you have no idea how much influence you have, though. I mean, I don't see the people at Simon & Schuster. I don't see their name on books when I go to Books A Million here in town, but I see yours like all over the place. (laughs) Well, yeah. (laughs) 
you know, maybe with the next one, I'll make sure I negotiate. Like the, in the contract will be, I must have a quote from my friend Joe on the front. You didn't, you didn't know you were going to get sabotaged this time down to the basement, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't know what I was coming in for for this one. <laughs> well, well, and I thought, I thought, you know, there's this idea of opportunity cost and you cover it in the book and we'll talk, we'll talk more about the book in general at the end of uh, our discussion but this idea of opportunity cost, people don't understand. And I love the story of you learning opportunity cost while working in, in a fast food chain. Tell me about that. <laughs> so I worked for it was a small franchise restaurants and it was actually ice cream. I'm not going to get into any more details than that, but it was a local franchise. I worked there as an administrative assistant, uh, very lowly. One of my jobs was to handle the paperwork that came in from the 12 different restaurants uh, every week. I, I had a spreadsheet that I put the information in, very old school. Well, the paperwork came wrapped in rubber bands. When I first started the job, in my desk, there was a drawer full of rubber bands. And I, I'm a frugal type of person, so I was saving the rubber bands coming in with the paperwork every week also, so there were another 12 rubber bands that were being added to this huge pile. The owner of the franchise walked by my desk one day while the drawer happened to be open, and he said to me, well, what's, what's with the rubber bands? And so I said, oh, they come in with the paperwork every week, blah, 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 blah. And he said to me, you know, I hate the idea of the managers having to buy new rubber bands. when We've got all these right here. So could you package them up and send them out to the managers? And in my head, I was going, do you know how much you pay me? <laughs> and I was 22 years old at the time. Like, it, I, so I, of course, I was never going to say that out loud. But, you know, it, did, it just did not occur to him. Like, yes, it was going to cost money that, you know, had to come from a line item in the budget for them to, you know, buy replacement rubber bands, you know, for the managers to do that. But the cost of my time, the cost to transport the rubber bands back to these 12 different stores, the cost of the packaging that we were going to have to pay for, it just, like, I have truly understood the phrase, spend a dollar to save a nickel when he suggested that. Yeah, it's like the person that drives all the way across town to save three cents on gas. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, same thing, but just as people... None of us really do a good job of opportunity cost. Why do you think that is? Well, we're not really wired to be completely rational. And I find that you tend to get more rational if you recognize that you're irrational, but you're never going to be able, be able to overcome it. The real problem comes in when you are convinced that you're rational. And that's when <laughs> you're like, oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And then you are most likely to fall for the scam artist or even just your own brains going, oh, yeah, this is a good deal. I'm going to drive, you know, another three miles to save three cents on gas. It, bad idea. What, yeah. uh, what do you do with opportunity cost when something's free? Because there's nothing bad with free is my favorite word. <laughs> It is a great word, but it's also the leading cause of unneeded clutter in one's house, I find, at least for me. You know, oh, it's free. I want it. I mean, I have more T-shirts because they are free that I don't wear because they're the wrong size. They're, they're not my style. They're a color that makes me look bilious. I mean, like, but it was free. So the word free has this tendency to scramble our brains. Like you said, it's your favorite word. So when something's free you think that there's no way you can lose on the prospect because you're like, well, I'm not spending any money. It's free. All I get is benefit from this. But the problem is you don't think through, well, what am I going to have to give up to get this? Because there's a transaction cost in every transaction. So for like the free t-shirts you get, you know, at the bank or at conferences or something like that, what you're losing is uh, the extra space in your t-shirt drawer, um, <laughs> you know, and those sorts of things. I think you're also losing some mind share. Like a concept that came to me late was that I can't think about everything. And the more clutter I have, I'm like, oh, I need to think about this piece of paper over here that two minutes ago was irrelevant, right? <laughs> and, then, and then it's not just about money. It's about time, which ends up being about money. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And you tend to, when, when you think about free, you don't do the research that you need to do. Uh, one of my favorite stories about this was from Dan Ariely's book, Predictably Irrational. He was at a nightclub that was offering free tattoos to patrons. So there were, uh, oh gosh, I think it was something like 72 people in line getting a tattoo. And a huge number of them would not have been getting a tattoo if it hadn't been free. So 76 people in line. 
52 of them said they wouldn't be getting them if it weren't free. And then four of them didn't know what design they wanted. And another five didn't know where, where they wanted a tattoo. So now there are people out there who get tattoos at the drop of a hat. And I get that. But the majority of us would spend a great deal of time before engaging in permanent body modification when we're paying for it. But all of a sudden it's free. It's like, all right, tattoo me up, baby. I think if you gave me free and a bunch of alcohol, I might be in that line. <laughs> but that's it. It would it would have to have the alcohol component, which is that's also opportunity cost, right? Yes. T- today's yes. fun versus tomorrow's, you know, what the heck was I thinking? Absolutely. What's what's the difference between opportunity cost and sunk cost? So the opportunity cost is what you could do with something in the future. So, you know, the the basic opportunity cost, like if I spend 10 bucks right now, I don't have that 10 bucks available to spend tomorrow. And then, uh, you know, you get into time opportunity costs. If I spend the, the afternoon watching Netflix, I don't have that time to do anything else. Some costs are the costs that have you've already spent and cannot recoup. So just to go back to tattoos, I remember meeting someone once who had a tattoo that he regretted. And I asked him, well, why don't you get it removed? He said, well, it's just sending good money after bad, which is a, a common refrain in sunk costs. Now, the thing is, like the, the money that you have spent on the tattoo is already gone. You're, there is no way you will ever get that back. And, you know, the pain that you've gone through already gone. <laughs> um, so deciding whether or not you want to get that tattoo removed should not have anything to do with the money you've already spent on the tattoo. So you get a lot of this with things like treadmills. You know, people will spend $400 on a treadmill. It sits in their laundry room and collects dust and, and bras and, and other things, you know, that, that you just lay on top of it. You say, OK, I really I should sell this. But by the time it's been sitting in your basement all this time, it ain't worth four hundred dollars anymore. But you refuse to sell it for anything less than what you paid for it because you want to get your money's worth out of it. Forgetting the fact that if you were to look at that as not your treadmill, but, you know, as just a, a treadmill that was for sale, you'd be like, I'll give you 20 bucks for it. <laughs> right. Sitting in somebody's house. I'm like, are you yeah. kidding me? That sort of thing. It's very difficult to uncouple this idea that, you know, what we paid for it is something that we can recoup in some way. You also get that. It's a big problem in investing. People don't want to sell a tanking stock because they paid, you know, $80 per share for it. And it's worth $12 a share. Well, if you hold on to it longer, it might only be worth $4 a share. You know, you have to recognize that you're not necessarily going to recoup the investment. I had that happen with a former client. This guy came into my office and he had a bunch of Ford stock. His whole retirement was in Ford stock and he worked at Ford and Mm. Ford had been trading at a high number. And it just started as the auto industry in Detroit was collapsing. Mm -hmm. Ford just kept going down with all of them. And uh, when I met him, it was worth maybe half of what he had paid for it. And I said, we don't need to sell today, but we do have to have a program where we start selling X percentage of it quarterly. And he Mm -hmm. said, I'm not selling any because I paid X, exactly what you're saying. I paid X Mm -hmm. and now it's worth half X. I'm going to wait for it to come back. And then (laughs) I will sell. And of course, at that time, I think it was trading at 14. And if I remember right, when it got to four, his spouse and I both fought with him about, it wasn't just me, it was she and I, he would no longer talk to me. I mean, he, he just, he just quit taking my calls and it's your, you know, my job's to be your coach. My job's to have a Mm -hmm. dissenting opinion. As the stock kept going down, I kept saying, I'm just doing my job, man. This is what you hired me to do to tell you that it doesn't matter that it was worth 40. And by the way, there's plenty of other industries that aren't sinking and, Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it just, it, I hate it. I hate it when I meet good people who get caught up in that type of irrational decision making. And I guess what you're implying is that is that thinking about sunk costs is irrational or are there times when sunk costs make sense? Well, there are times when it does make sense to take sunk costs into account. The problem is we fall into the sunk cost fallacy which is thinking that sunk costs should affect your future decisions. For instance, you get this a lot with uh, wasted time. Let's say there's someone who goes to medical school and he realizes, you know, after spending all that time and money in medical school in his first year of residency, that he would rather claw his own eyes out than become a doctor. In a lot of cases, people will be like, I'm just going to grin and bear it because I don't want to have wasted all that money and time in medical school. Well, the thing is, you've wasted all that money and time no matter what decision you make now, because you hate what you're doing. 
So if you decide to continue along that path because you don't want to have wasted that time, all you're doing is wasting more money and more time doing something that you hate when you could cut your losses and to start following the path that you really want. I got to ask you a question on a slight tangent. You can confess to us. Nobody's listening to this, but I heard that you're a satisficer. <laughs> yes, I am a satisficer. <laughs> what the hell is a satisficer? And how do you, how do you get that job? Do you put that, is that on your LinkedIn profile that you're a satisficer? <laughs> um, well, actually part of my satisficing, I don't have a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> Probably about 12 years ago, I read a book called The Paradox of Choice by um, Barry Schwartz. It was life changing. And it's about the fact that there are two types of people in the world. There are the maximizers who believe that there is a platonic ideal of anything out there, whatever it is you're doing. So if you're trying to find a job, there's a platonic ideal of that job. If you're trying to find a pair of new, new pair of jeans, there's a platonic ideal of those jeans. That means platonic ideal means that it's like there's a pair of jeans that actually fits exactly correct and is by heaven. Yes. Is that, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. mean, they, they, they fit well, yeah. they're comfortable. Yeah. They don't stretch uh, after a few By days. The they make your butt look good. I mean, like they're not too long. They're not too short. They're, you know, I'm not, I, <laughs> they don't have weird pockets. I'm not that guy, Emily. I don't believe yeah. that. That's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> so, um, so a maximizer will not rest until they find that ideal. So that means uh, not only do they spend a great deal of time researching, you know, like, okay, I've looked at seven pairs of jeans at this store. I'm going to go to that store and look at another 10 pairs and go to that store and look at another five pairs. But once they finally buy a pair, they keep looking because they keep thinking, well, what if the pair I got isn't as good as something else out there? So that's the maximizer. On the other side, they've got satisficers who recognize like, these are my bare minimum needs. So once I reach them, I'm good. And I am a satisficer. So when I'm looking for jeans, for one thing, I know I have really short legs. I know I'm not going to find jeans that are the right length. So just out the window. So for me, it's a matter of like, do they fit? Do they feel good? Do they, are they the color blue I like? And those are like my three things. And then everything else, eh, it's fine. Studies have shown that satisficers are much, much more content and happy than maximizers. They, really? they enjoy their purchases more. Really? Yes. So you're saying if I wait for the exact right thing, I'm going to be less happy. Statistically, I'm going to be less happy than somebody that just goes, yeah, that's in the general direction. Give it to me. Yeah. I mean, and that's not to say that you should um, uh, compromise or, or compromise on things that are really important to you, but it's about prioritizing what's important to you. My husband will kill me for telling the story, but I'm going to tell the story. Perfect. <laughs> well, you know, nobody's listening, so you're good. <laughs> so I'm good. I'm good. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer and he used to work for Honda when we first met and uh, it was not a very good fit. And so we were, we, he was talking about what kind of job that he wanted. And this is a, a big deal because he he's specialized enough that he has to move to get a new job. I mean, he's he, he's got a specialized kind of job. So he started saying like, well, I want a job where it's the kind of engineering that I'm interested in and I feel respected and it's not too far of a commute and, you know, the salary is good and the uh, the bonuses are good and it has good health insurance. And like he just he listed it was like 10 things. He's a maximizer. And I said to him, honey, you're not going to get all of that in one job. <laughs> and he was like, that is the most pessimistic thing I've ever heard you say to me. <laughs> and like. Like, I hate it when pessimists describe this way, but no, honey, I'm being realistic. The job you're describing is job charming. Like, it doesn't exist. <laughs> I think some people need to learn that in dating. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's it's like, true. hey, all those traits, that perfect person you're looking for, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think they're there. I think I think everybody's got a little something, you know. Mm -hmm. but, so, but, and I... I was like, figure out what are the top three most important things to you. You can find the three most important things to you in your job and it'll work out. And uh, it's a process. I, I When I read uh, The Paradox of Choice 12 years ago, I was so blown away. I was like, you have to read this book. And I said it too strongly and too many times. And he's like, never. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do that with my son. I tell him to read books. He's like, great. Never reading it. Fantastic. <laughs> Good yeah, deal. Yeah. yeah. The book is End Financial Stress Now. By the way, you're somebody that's written so many deep, deep pieces for major publications and books that are on going into depth. This is a big, wide, heady topic. Why ending financial stress and why write that now? Well, there, there are a couple of reasons. I have always been very interested in my own irrational behavior, particularly when it comes to money. 
this book has been years and years in the making. As I've been reading more stuff, it helps me better understand my own reaction to any number of money situations. I had been thinking about it for a long time. And then I wanted to write a book that was going to be helpful to people who are at any point in their careers. Um, for one thing, uh, my, my previous three books were, were geared towards retirement. Yeah, I wanted to read a book that the friends I went to college with might be interested in. <laughs> So <laughs> there's a little ego wrapped up in this is what I've heard. <laughs> just a little, just a little. It was also my publisher has gotten to the point where they were asking me what I wanted to write. Uh, you know, our, our relationship has been uh, prior to this. They they had come up with ideas and asked me to write them. And then this time around, they're like, well, what would you like to write? And I said, I would like to write this. <laughs> so this is something I, I really have been wanting to work on. And then the other thing that, um, you know, I read a lot of personal finance one of my pet peeves is that it often seems to be geared towards people who are relatively privileged wealth-wise. You know, there, there's a lot of really good advice, and I'm not going to say that that's not true. But there are times when they talk about things, and it just seems like, you know, for folks who are juggling two jobs, like a clueless piece of, of advice. So I wanted to write something that was going to be more universal. I mean, it's never going to be completely universal, but, but uh, advice that was going to help people at any place on the income spectrum. So that was something that I was really kind of focusing on and trying to gear towards, like letting people know, even if they're working two jobs, that there are ways to reduce your financial stress. We've had that issue on our roundtable discussions on Friday sometimes. I like to talk about poverty and money because I think it's a really, th there's a deep conversation there. And sometimes I feel like the participants on our roundtable discussions, there are people that are so good with money that they, that, that they don't, if there's no jobs in your town, just move, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is, by the way, the right solution. Yeah. yeah. But living in a town where the median income is just over $30,000 a year, I get why that's, you know, that's, it's convenient and it sounds good, but man, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, there's a lot more there than that. But anyway, that's what, that, that's your next appearance. We need to talk about that more. <laughs> the book is on financial stress now, immediate steps you can take to improve your financial outlook. Uh, you talk about everything from psychological reasons why you struggle with money, achieving a stress-free financial life, economic reasons why we struggle with money. And by the way, you've got all kinds of, like it's an action book. I like the fact that at the end of your chapters, you've got all the different things that you probably should be working on. Um, but it's guilt-free too. So mm -hmm. there you go. Thanks for hanging out, Emily. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure. Except when I'm bothering you about my name not being on the cover. <laughs> Even that I can handle. Hey, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. The New York Stock Exchange party continues. Hey, who dropped the icing all over my mic? God, you guys are slobs. I swear, you feed these guys some cake and they lose the only ounce of self-control they ever had. I even think I'm the only one who knows this show is on the clock. Speaking of the clock, the New York Stock Exchange has a specific signal they use to begin and end each day. A bell. But it hasn't always been that way. Here's today's question. What was the original signal used by the New York Stock Exchange to mark the beginning and end of each day? I'll be back with the answer after I see if Gertrude wants to share some of my nachos. OG and I are excited to have two sponsors at Stacking Benjamins that we can send people to who will help any of our listeners get their financial house in order. First of all, let's solve your debt problems by sending you to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. That's S-O-F-I. We talked to Dan Macklin about SoFi because they started in student loans, but then quickly moved on from there. We wondered exactly why they started with student loans. Student loans just seem to be a bigger issue for people. There's over a trillion dollars of student loan debt out there. And it, was, it really is and, and continues to be a pretty inefficient market. Lots of people overpaying. But we've quickly moved on from that. So as well as student loans, we're now doing other things, including mortgages and personal loans. But student loans was just a, a great entry point because so many people were overpaying. So if you're someone who's overpaying for student loans or for other types of debt, whether it be mortgage or personal loans, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash SoFi. And... 
Once you've been there, we'll send you to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Because the thing about magnify money that I find really cool is that they do not ask for any personal information before showing you how different financial products rank against each other. And part of that rating system is just how little fine print there is. So we asked Nick Clement, CEO at Magnify Money, to explain more about their rating system and helping you avoid fine print. Oh, the fine print can get out of control. You'll always see marketing, which tells you this is free or we're even going to put money in your pocket if you do business with us. But then when you look underneath the hood, you can find fees on top of fees on top of fees. And some, some of the worst are in the world of overdrafts where you can be charged $35 per item. And then after five days of a negative balance charge, another $35, particularly in that area, you see banks that are worse than payday lenders, although they're not advertised that way. So for checking accounts, savings accounts, and debt products that you understand, head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Welcome back, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And before the break, I asked you this question. What was the original signal used by the New York Stock Exchange to mark the beginning and end of each day? The answer, a gavel. Wait, what's that? There's no weenies left. Well, this is me signaling the party and my trivia are officially coming to a close. See ya. Big thanks to Emily Guy Birkin for joining us today. <laughs> it's funny. You, you kind of foreshadowed it. Emily nailed it. You know, we talked about my client with the Ford stock. And we just wanted to wait until it came back. Sunk cost. Man, that's an important concept. It doesn't matter where your dollar's been. It's where it's going to go tomorrow. And where it is today, right? right? You know, you see people do this stuff all the time. Like, well, I've already paid the guy $2,000. So dot, 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 dot. It's like, no. That, that does not factor into the equation at all anymore. Right. It, that is gone money. Like, make a decision based on this movie. It forward. is what it is. Deal with it yeah. the way it is, not there the way. Go. Who is that? Jack Welch, I think, had a great line about dealing with reality as it is, not as you wish it were, or you hoped it yep. should be. Something yep. like that. Yeah, good stuff. I don't know who said that, but I've heard of Tony Robbins one similarly that you can see things how they are, not better than they are, how worse or worse than they are, yeah. but just how they are. All these gurus claimed the phrase and they just. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let's throw out David Lifeline and tackle some of life's, or rather life insurance's most important questions. Our friends down at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they're disrupting the whole life insurance industry by focusing on those two things you value most, your family and your time. That's why they've created the only affordable term life insurance policy you can purchase entirely online without a medical exam. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to learn more about life insurance the modern way. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life. Uh, speaking of Haven Life, own Ben Z, for those of you that were here uh, a couple Thursdays ago when he was on our Facebook page chat, you can find that on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash I Stack Benjamins. Jerome was just on our friend Jill Schlesinger's show. I really like Jill Schlesinger, like Jill on money on the radio and like better off. And, uh, she just had our friends at Haven Life on talking about the disruption they're doing. So if you want to know more about Haven Life, go listen to Jill's show as well or go back and, and go to our Hangout on the Facebook page. And on that note, by the way, I am going to be on Jill's show coming up soon. We just recorded it and uh, that'll be a lot of fun. I'll let everybody know when that happens. But for now, here's what's happening. We're throwing out the lifeline to our friend Jordan. Say hello, Jordan. Hey, Joe and OG. Uh, listening to a recent episode raised some questions for me regarding tax deductions for work mileage. My job requires me to travel each day around town to various appointments, and uh, my employer pays a monthly mileage reimbursement for gas and wear and tear on my vehicle, but nothing specifically for mileage. My question is, does this reimbursement from my employer exclude me from taking a mileage deduction on my taxes. Thanks for all you do. Love the show. Thanks for the question, Jordan. And I have to preface our answer to this question of we are not tax people and we don't know Jordan's whole situation. So uh, our answers are for entertainment purposes only. But I think that we have uh, directionally probably OG. We've got him covered. 
Hey, Jordan. Yeah, this is a great way to retain employees and hire new ones and stuff like that as an employer. If you help with those uh, car related expenses, really, it's going to boil down to what your company is reimbursing you for and what the factor is that they're taking a look at. So, for example, if you were doing this on your own, right, like let's say that you didn't have a uh, employer that was uh, reimbursing you anything, you can choose every year on your taxes whether or not you want to take the standard mileage rate which changes year to year, but it's around 53 cents a mile. Or you can take the actual mile or actual expenses, right? You take all your receipts for gas and maintenance and that sort of thing. Most people just use the mileage because it's a little bit easier to calculate. But regardless of which option you choose, you have to have really good records for that. Now, your employer may be reimbursing you at a different rate. And my understanding would be that you can then claim that difference. So let's say that your employer is reimbursing you at 20 cents a mile but the IRS would reimburse you at 53 cents a mile. My understanding is that you could get that other 33 cents, so to speak, on your taxes, but not the full amount because you're obviously getting some some from your employer already. So you're going to want to check with your HR department or payroll department and see, you know, what factors they're using to calculate your mileage reimbursement for the uh, for the week. And then also, uh, obviously, you got to talk with a CPA or tax professional to see the deductibility of the extra uh, stuff based on your situation. But um, but my understanding is that you should be able to kind of, if you're not being paid the full amount, you can add up to the full amount. Good stuff. Uh, if you've got a question for the Haven Lifeline, you want us to throw out the lifeline to you, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. We also get letters down here in the basement. And today's letter comes to us from our brand spanking new friend, Taylor. Taylor said he's heard it isn't smart to begin investing until he's paid off your high interest credit card debt because the interest you're paying is most likely higher than any rate of return you would get from investing the money. Taylor's 25, just recently began his career, and he knows the importance of starting early. However, he's also in a couple grand of credit card debt. He's contributing 6% of his salary to his Roth 401k, but he also wants to get into the market in other ways as soon as possible. What do we suggest? Thanks. This one's super simple. Uh, contribute your 401k to whatever the match is that your company is going to provide but, and use every extra dollar to pay off debt. Because the rate of return, once you add in the match, I mean, that's a that could be a free 50% or 100%. Yeah, that's already 50%. Yeah, it could be, right? So if you're, com- you're doing six and your employer matches you three, right, that's, that's an immediate 50% return on your money. So using the logic that Taylor said a few seconds ago of, I want to pay the higher interest off first, that's true, but if you're getting a 50% return on your match, so to speak, you want to you wanna keep that in force. But everything else, got to pay off the credit card bills, got to build a cash reserve, do it in the right order. Because if you don't, then you've got this investment account that's got all sorts of cool stuff in it that you can't touch, but you're nearly bankrupt because you know you got too much personal debt or you don't have a cash reserve or whatever the case may be. So take the next year. It will not matter in the grand scheme of things. But it will matter if you don't have your debt paid off. So pay the debt off, build a cash reserve, and then go like gangbusters into your investment account. How rare is it when I have absolutely zip to add, nothing to add? Because it is opportunity cost, right? Getting back to Emily Guy Birkin. And so it comes around full circle. The whole episode begins and ends. It's the circle of life. It's the Mobius loop. And it rules us all. It's like that bracelet you could buy in Sky Mall magazine. You don't know where it begins or where it ends. All you know is you paid $165 for it and it's 100% plastic. But it's pure metal. <laughs> 100% pure metal. 100% metal. Where can I get metal? Mm. Thanks for the questions. If you've got a question for the show, Haven Lifeline is the place to go. Once again, stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. If you want to send us a letter, joe at stackybedjamins.com will also get you there. Or for both of those, if you head to just Stacky Benjamin's homepage, it says uh, show question, question mark, click that link, and you'll find the Haven Lifeline and the way to send us letters. Also, if you've got deeper questions and you think you need somebody in your corner, well, guess what? OG's taking clients and the way to get on his calendar to schedule a meeting, a virtual meeting with him to talk about your situation and how you can get him in your corner. It's stackybedjamins.com forward slash letter O and letter G, stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG. Man, that's going to do it. Big thanks again to Emily Guy Birkin. Well, you know, Doug's going to do all this, OG. But coming up on Friday, our roundtable episode, OG's done for the week. We bring in some of the top 
bloggers and podcasters from around the nation and sometimes from around the world. So you could kind of say around the universe. Yeah, from around the universe. We also have a FinTech Friday segment where we introduce you to something I think is pretty cool that you can have on your phone or maybe something on the computer. This week we're talking about Money Lion and uh, what an interesting <sighs> concept Money Lion is. All right. Go, <sighs> go Stacks and Benjamins. We'll see you Friday. So, folks, what were you supposed to learn today in between all of that blathering on by Joe and OG? Well, first, Emily Guy Birkin made a good point about opportunity cost. Weighing your decisions ahead of time to see which is the best opportunity sounds easy, but is often overlooked. By taking just a second longer, maybe you can make better decisions with your money. Second, remember our Johnny Depp headlines. By setting up some roadblocks between you and your money, you can often come out ahead. But the biggest lesson, don't share nachos with Gertrude because she'll eat them all. I'll bet she's also that person who says, I'm just going to have one of these. We'll just, I just want one of your fries. Oh, are you going to eat all of that chocolate mousse? Right? God, that's so Gertrude. Old Uncle Doug's still hungry. And like Joe's mom says, I'm a growing boy. Somebody bring me more food. Stat. Thanks to Emily Guy Birkin for joining us. You'll find more on her book, End Financial Stress Now, wherever books are sold. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC. The show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. And after that Gertrude Nacho debacle, huge thanks to Joe's mom for sneaking over a few little cookies. She winked at me while saying some load about giving them to Gertrude's dog. Yeah, right, but I know the signal. Looks like these little treats called milk bones are really for old Doug. Man, are they delicious. And my, my teeth are so clean and white now. Well, you've seen a lot of movies. I've seen a lot of movies. I've seen three more in the Netflix queue. We can't talk about any of those. I can't, oh. I can't wait to talk about all of those. I saw a movie that a lot of people are wondering about. This is a little film I'm sure you haven't heard of OG called Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. The fate of the universe lies on your shoulders. Now, whatever you do, don't push this button. Because that will set off the bomb immediately and we'll all be dead. Now, repeat back what I just said. I agree. No! No, that's the button that will kill everyone. Try again. I am Groot. Mm-hmm. I am Groot. Uh-huh. I am Groot. No! Showtime, a-holes. And the fun begins again. Uh, this movie, the, the volume one, First Guardians of the Galaxy, was something that renewed my faith in uh, the Marvel series because I was starting to get a little bored with Iron Man, Iron Man 2, Iron Man 3, Thor, Thor 2, Thor 16. Uh, just, I felt like there wasn't a lot of innovation and new stuff. And then Guardians of the Galaxy comes along, blows me away because it was so funny 
It was so fresh. It was so kind of stupid. And I absolutely loved you. You saw Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I don't remember having the same opinion of it as you, but. Yeah, I thought that one was great. So I went in here just all fired up to see it. Expectations maybe a little high because I, I didn't love it. I did not love it. I thought it was still funny. I thought it was still goofy. And I expect Guardians of the Galaxy to be goofy. You know, I walked in this time going, okay, it's going to be goofy. It's going to be funny. The plot, though, was so convoluted. There was so much just garbage going on in so many different storylines that it just, it succeeds on the jokes and the quality of the jokes, like Groot wanting to push the wrong button over and over. And those are funny. And they, they got me through it. But the actual story, I just, I didn't care. I didn't think it was... I didn't think it was fun. I didn't think it was worthwhile. And it brought me back to this. It just felt like a movie I've seen before. And I got to say, I'm pretty damn tired of being spoon-fed a bunch of comic book movies. I just, oh, this. this well, here's the great news. They only go for four more years. I know. Two a year for the next four years. I know. I saw Guardians of the Galaxy 3 will be the same cast, and they announced uh, just a few weeks ago that they are going to do another series of Guardians of the Galaxy, but it's going to be a different cast of characters. So it will be different Guardians. Hmm. But, you know, was this movie fun? Yep. Popcorn, good time. Did I laugh? Absolutely, I laughed. I did not. Kurt Russell uh, plays a big part in this movie. I I didn't understand his character. Um, (laughs) I I didn't get... I, I just, I didn't, I don't know. I didn't care. I just didn't care. I didn't love it. Didn't, didn't think it was great. So uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, thumbs down from me. I know a lot of my friends, though, OG, said every bit as good as the first one. I'm like, are you nuts? It's nowhere as good as the first one. Like, just, just not even close. But um, some people I trust a lot thought it was fantastic. <laughs> so I don't know. Not for me. Well, though. in other sequel news, you'll be happy to hear this as well. I did hear that the original cast has signed back on for another season of Arrested Development on Netflix. Are you kidding me? Yes. So apparently, I didn't even know that they did this, but apparently they did a season four on Netflix years ago, and it was kind of met with a tepid response because jokes were good, kind of funny, but it was very discombobulated. I guess they couldn't record all at the same time and so on and so forth. So really, you, you watched it, didn't you? No, I watched the first three seasons. I didn't know that they made a fourth season. Oh, you never saw the net. I swear to God, we talked about the Netflix nope. season, you and I. No, nope, never did. Yeah, but not anyway, that great. So I'll go watch that, and I heard it wasn't as good. But no. this one, they promise, is going to be back to normal. Everybody's on set the whole time. You know what uh, they did with that first uh, Netflix season where they screwed up? They had way too many cameos. Like, they had a bunch of cameos from from very famous people all over it. And they got good at those. Like, the the ones with Charlize Theron are some of my favorites. Like, that yeah, whole character. She the- oh, that's so funny. I don't want to spoil that. Yeah, because the more you find out about who she really is and who she isn't, that's like half that joke. And uh, who's Mister F? Just, that must be Mister F. Just, just, just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, but anyway, so that'll be cool. I can't remember when they said it was coming out. Maybe another year or something. That right? is good news. I do like that, and I hope that that's that's really good. I hope this was good, and I was excited about seeing him again. But man, and that's what happens when you do really good in the first movie. I think that is it. Like the expectations are so high. Be like if they made another Star Wars, right? I mean, you think, hey, once once you get through Star Wars 1, 2, and 3 and you go, it can't get any better than this. Yeah, but I definitely thought that that, that the last two Star Wars fulfilled my expectations. And I know they didn't, you know. I I didn't care for Rogue One a ton. Yeah, man, I did. The very end I liked. Oh, do you, you, you like happy endings then? Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, that was, that was really exciting. <laughs> but I, I liked how it tied it together, right? Cause the whole yeah. time, cause you know what's happening, you know where it's going to end. And I'm trying to figure out like, how are they going to, how close do they put this to the next episode? And like, literally it's like, and cut and action. It's, it's like so the great. Scene. It's so they, great. They do a great job just like that. But, uh, yeah. but the whole time you're wondering where does this fit in the storyline? You know, I how enjoyed far it. Back. I thought it was a great ride. I really enjoyed Rogue One. Well, I did too, but it is, you know. I get you. I get you. Talk about formulaic. I hear you. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. The last the last two and, have been pretty good. Disney's formulaic. got that down, right? I mean, yeah, that's they, a, they know exactly what they're doing. That's us. 
that they're making bags of money on top of bags of money on all these. And that's the thing about Marvel. We're just going to be, but, but, but you know, I like guardians of the galaxy. Maybe I like the first one cause it was so different. And now that I knew that it was going to be different now, the shock values worn off because Deadpool, you know, they're coming out with another Deadpool. When I saw, I De- saw that one, yeah. when I saw Deadpool, I knew nothing about it. And I went, Oh, I mean, it just hits you from a place you didn't think it was coming from. And from the very beginning of Deadpool, you're on this great ride, just this fantastic ride. And so, you know, second Deadpool, am I going to have the same feeling? I guess we'll we'll wait and see. But you've got movies. I've got movies. It's going to be a steady dose of movies here uh, coming up the next few weeks. Okay. All right. 